If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 6. And we'll read, we'll read from verse 9 through verse 15, because that's the, the prayer. But we're going to look and focus really on thy kingdom come. Matthew chapter 6, beginning to verse 9. And after this matter, therefore pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, then neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Let me start out at the very beginning by saying he is not talking about losing your salvation here. God does forgive you of your sin when you repent of your sin and put your faith and trust. He's saying, though, is if you have multiplied egregiousness against someone and someone has, you've done things to them, if you don't forgive those who do things to you, God's not going to forgive you. So what it makes you're not going to have peace and rest until you get to heaven. You're not going to lose your salvation but you will lose the joy that you have in the Lord. So we need to make sure we always forgive people. But here he says, Thy kingdom come. I want to take a fresh look at this tonight. And I hope that this really registers with you the way that it did with me. Because there's an inherent strength and compassion that's in this, this prayer. And I love the fact that it comes from, from God the Father. And notice what he says. He is our Father. That's how God looks at himself. You want to have God looks at himself? He sees himself. As your father, as my father. Of course, he's a perfect father. Then moves throughout all of this, this, this um, message is a beauty and a serenity that no mortal man can ever explain. We, we can talk about it day in and day out and day in and day out and never explain every single bit of it. But it reassures our hearts and it gives us strength and, and resolve to carry on in the world in which we live. Why? Because it is God who he himself views himself as your father, as my father. So with that as a backdrop, uh, Philip Keller, he had written a book, it was called An Ordinary Man and the Child of God. And in there he talks about all the different things and then he goes much, much deeper. And it's about 250 pages and I've only got 15 pages of notes. So his is gonna be a little much more deeper. But th that would've been something new on a Sunday morning but take about two or three years to get through it. But if you wanna look up Philip Keller, uh, he explains this whole uh, prayer much, much deeper than we can cover on a Wednesday night. And it's called, An Ordinary Man and the Child of God is the title of it. Now then, this, this is called the Lord's Prayer. Next to Psalm 23, the Lord's Prayer is the most universally beloved passages. It's quoted more, it's written more, and it's been repeated millions and millions of times by individuals over the last 2,000 years. Yet, in spite of all this use, the familiarity with it is never lost. It never lost its luster. In fact, it, it, the more we study, the more we realize how incredible it really is. Look at verse 10, when it says, Thy kingdom come, and next week we'll expand that to where it says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But tonight, His will comes first. So Jesus is teaching them to be praying for the coming of God's kingdom and the fulfillment of his will. And in all places and in all times. And we'll talk about that. All places and all times. To pray this in sincerity is to ask God for everything that Jesus had accomplished to accomplish in and through us. And by the way, he says that he will do that. He's bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth at some point in the future. Now, it was here in the past when Jesus was here because he made it clear if you've seen me, what have you seen? You've seen the kingdom of God. He made it clear. So there was a past when the kingdom was here. There's the present that the kingdom's here in your heart, in your heart, in your heart, in your heart, in, your heart, in my heart. Because we are believers and the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And because of that, the kingdom is here. But there's a future kingdom that's coming. And when that kingdom comes, that's when Jesus comes back with all power and all authority as king of kings forever and ever and ever. That's when that kingdom will completely Come. But until then, we've got a part to play. We've got a role that God expects out of us. He says, 
your kingdom come. When Jesus taught his disciples this amazing prayer, known as the Lord's Prayer, he starts out by making, and we, we studied this, but by making sure they understand that this does come from the Father. God's blessings come from God the Father. And the first thing we should want, before we want any blessings for us, we should say, God, I want your name to be hallowed. I want your name to be holy. I want your name to be sanctified and lifted up. So what did he mean here when he's praying that kingdom come? Are we praying for a spiritual kingdom or a kingdom just in people's hearts? Is it a matter of eating and drinking or is it righteousness and peace in the Holy Spirit? According to Romans chapter 14 and verse 17, it is the righteousness and the peace and the joy that the Holy Spirit does in your life and in my life. Why? Because we are believers. We are followers of our Father who is in heaven. And so it does have to do with a spiritual dynamic, but there also has to do with, according to Ephesians, a physical dynamic. So the church, our we're part of the body of Christ, the global church. The church is one part, if you will, or one form of the kingdom of God. We're a community of people who are taught through faith by that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We put our faith and trust in Him. And then the indwelling of the Holy Spirit comes into our life and helps us to serve Christ in this world. And that's, that helps to bring about the kingdom of God. By words and deeds, they help to establish the signs. Notice this, the signs of the kingdom to come, just as when Jesus was here in his lifetime. He referred to his own miracles as what? Signs of the kingdom. The miracles of Jesus, these are the signs. And of course, the kingdom was standing there doing the miracles. People then they totally missed it. He said these are bright spots. The sick were healed, the dead were raised, the hungry were fed, the blind received their eyesight, the deaf their hearing, and sins were forgiven. That's the kingdom of God. That's what he's saying. I want all of this. When Jesus was here, this was manifest. And we're going to see. It, could, it should be manifest in your life and in my life also. So the, the raises this question that we need to answer. And that we need to answer this. Is Jesus really? Is he the promised messianic king? The king of Israel. The king of the church today. When John the Baptist had been imprisoned by Herod, no doubt whether Jesus, he began to doubt Jesus was really the Messiah or not. And so he sent word, he asked, are you the one who was to come or should we expect another? That's Matthew 11, verse 2, then verses 3 through 6 affirm that. The answer that Jesus sent back was direct quotation from Isaiah, chapter 29, verses 18 and 19. And if you'll look at Isaiah chapter 35, you'll see the quotation slips over into a prophetic vision about a renewed creation. And that renewed creation will be part of the kingdom of God. Let your kingdom come. This, you got to agree, this is complex. It's much, much more than just what we think. It's more than physical. Yes, we want his physical kingdom to come. It's more than spiritual. Yes, we want his spiritual kingdom to come. It's already come in him, and it's gone back, but he said the Holy Spirit can live in our lives. So now it's here on earth with us, in us, and we're supposed to be sharing it with others. Because he says, continues on in Isaiah, he says, Then, when the Messiah comes, then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears will be of the deaf will be unstopped, the lame will leap like the deer, and the mute shall have a tongue of joy. Water shall gush forth from the wilderness, and streams will burst out in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, and thirsty ground will be bubbling springs, and in the halls where the jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus, will all grow there. That's Isaiah 35, verse 5 through 7. So Isaiah said, when you see these things happening, you know the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus comes, Jesus fulfills all those and more. So what does that tell you? It tells you he was the Messiah. He was the one. He is the king, and so therefore, he's the one we're to follow because he is the king. So immediately before saying this, in Isaiah he says, be strong and do not fear. For your God will come, and he will come with a vengeance for divine ret retribution. He will come to you, and he will save you. That's Isaiah 35 and verse 4. And then John tells us, he says, you are the king. You are the Messiah who will bring judgment to the godless, and then you will establish your kingdom of peace. And Jesus never denied it when he made that statement. There are three phases of the kingdom. 
What is the kingdom of God? Where is the kingdom of God? And how does the kingdom of God really function? How does it work? Basically, whatever God does, including Jesus Christ with all his authority, it is the kingdom. It is the kingdom past, and through us it's the kingdom present. And one day, we will experience the kingdom of the future. But he said, I want your kingdom here on earth. So when Jesus was in person on earth, that first phase of the kingdom was present. And now the Holy Spirit lives in us, it's present. And one day it will come back and it will be the last time that the kingdom is the forever kingdom. Notice it says the kingdom is present in Jesus. Jesus answered that question about the kingdom of God by saying the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation. In other words, you can't pick and choose what days. So these people that say, 88 reasons Jesus has come back 88, you know, they're, they're off right on. Jesus said, you, there's no calculation, no, 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 no kind of numbers you can put together with this and this and this, and that's when he's coming back. Nobody knows. He said, well, make, one thing, make sure this. He says, nobody's ever going to know, but do know this, is that it is coming. We don't know when, but we do know that he is coming. He says, this, by the way, he says, it is in you. The Spirit of God is within you. It's also translated among you. And it's both. The Holy Spirit tonight, if you're a believer, he's in your heart, he's in your life, but not only in your heart and in your life, he's with us here. So we have him in our lives individually, and when we gather together, we have him here with us. And both meanings are true. So, so what, wherever Jesus is, the kingdom is, where the size of the kingdom is at, that's where the kingdom is present. And, of course, Scripture tells us that Jesus wanted us also to go out and do miracles even greater than he would do. Can't imagine doing anything greater than Jesus. But then that what he told the disciples? When you really understand, he's telling the disciples, when you really understand in John 14, 12, you understand what miracles are, you yourself will go out and do miracles that I did and even greater than I ever did. And that's what he's telling the disciples. And by the way, who are his disciples of today? It's us, the church. Those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ with everything we get. It, it's, in, it's in his kingdom basket, so to speak. I have no backup plan. If this doesn't work, I would say, well, okay, we'll, we'll, let, let, let's, let's punt and, and try this later. There's no way. If you put every bit of your faith, every bit of your trust in him, and thus he says, if that's the case, we should be doing greater things. Now, don't say, by the way, the doing greater things doesn't necessarily mean that you're out healing people, healing the blind, and all, and all that. I mean, I've, I've seen some, some things around the world I just, I can't, I don't understand. I know my, my first time to Africa when I was in Tanzania, I met a, a, a village chief that his daughter had died when she was like 10 years old. And he tells a story about a, a man coming through, a man in white. And he, and he witnessed to him and was telling him about, about God, how much God loved him, and God, he was created for a purpose. And, he, and the, the girl had been dead for three days. And they were getting ready to bury her. They'd done all the things supposed to do. And the man just went over and he just laid across her. And she was healed. And I thought, okay, well, that, God can do those kinds of things, certainly. But I'm a skeptic, okay? I'm sorry, I am. I really am kind of the, you know, if you're telling me that, show me. Well, I didn't even have to say that because he said, and there she is now. And there's this about 27 year old lady that, that, that's coming down, and that's his daughter. And she was still healed. How did that happen? Why did that happen? I don't know. But I'll say this, that whole village attributes it to God. And they're doing what they're, they can do and with the knowledge they've got to try to serve God. But also he talks about the year of the Lord's favor. Although the kingdom of God came very near in Christ's first coming to Israel, of course they rejected him. The first phase of the kingdom was over. It wasn't yet time to fulfill the earth, to fulfill the earth. That's part of our ministry. Luke reports this as follows. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and to recover the sight of the blind and to release the oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled down the scroll and he gave it to an attendant that was set down, where he's returning where it goes in the synagogue. And then he announced, now This is Jesus. He just got through reading scripture. He says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That's Luke chapter 4, verse 18 through 21. 
that when we look at this passage and we look at the one in Isaiah chapter 61, it includes a few more words than Jesus read. For it does say to proclaim the day of the vengeance of our God is added to that. Jesus knew that it was not yet time for God's vengeance. That's part of why he didn't say it. That's part of the vengeance. When God comes back, he's coming back in peace and joy and justice and all those things. But he's also come back in vengeance. Vengeance is a part of the new kingdom. Because he's told this world over and over. And, and, and we talk about the favor of the day of the Lord. Do you realize it could have been one day that it was a favor? It's been 2,000 years. Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, and that day was the day that when God had favor on you and on me and on all those people. And now he's still given that opportunity. There's a day coming when a man won't get on his knees. He'll have no desire to be saved whatsoever. He'll be lost as a goose. Have no desire to be saved. And he'll say things like, I know it's good for you, but it just doesn't mean anything to me. And he'll miss eternity because those, then the favor has been removed. The favor's there today. That's why I think there's an urgency that the Holy Spirit puts inside of us to go and make uh, disciples of the nation. First, we see in that first presence, Jesus himself was one spreading the gospel worldwide. Then there's the judgment, and then Jesus comes back. Of course, he's talking about the judgment in Revelation. When we look at the hidden form of the kingdom, it's in the hearts of the people. And the kingdom is outward, but it's also inward, and it is worldwide. And if if you ever get a chance to go overseas and see what God's doing in some amazing places, God's working everywhere. Ethiopia, you name it, wherever. God's, God's at work everywhere I've ever been. Seventy different countries, and God's been working in every single one of them. Some greater than others, but certainly he's been in every one of them. That, if, if I take away one thing from all the trial I've done, is I got to see God at work. And God's day of favor is still here for everybody. If they'll just believe. But then he talks about the Holy Spirit. He says, after the Lord had completed his work on the cross and given his blood for the sins of the world, after he had broken the power of sin, after he had defeated the devil, and after he defeated the powers of darkness, he was triumphant with the resurrection, and immediately before his ascension, his disciples asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has sent only His Son. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, stop there for a moment. What did it just say? He's talking to you. He's talking to the disciples. He's talking to believers. He's talking to us if we're His disciples. And he says, you will be witnesses to me. He, Jesus said, I've done what I'm going to do. I'm going back to heaven. Go back to the Father. I've done what I'm going to do, and now it's your turn. And that's what he says here. He says, it's not your time to know about Israel. When, when will the kingdom of Israel be restored? In good time. It's none of your business, though. That's for God to know. He says, but you will receive power. This is what you focus on. You will receive fire when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So if you've had the Holy Spirit fill your life, you've had him come upon you. And you, perhaps, if you get a chance, will be witnesses to him. That's not what he says. You will. And by the way, that is an emphatic you will. You will receive power when the Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, until the ends of the earth. That's Acts chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. So here are the last words. We see Jesus as the Shekinah glory of God is going up. And what is he doing? He's commissioning them. Go out and tell others. You, you know, how many times do we say, boy, I tell you, this world has gotten so bad, I am ready to go home. How many, how many of you feel like that, really? I mean, I, uh, book me a seat on the next bus out. Let me tell you how to, how to hasten that day. You start going, you start telling people about Jesus. You go to all the different nations of the world. You proclaim his name. Because that's what he said we're supposed to do. And you're hastening that day. Now he knew you would hasten that day. And that's, that's one of the reasons I love being able to do, to do missions is you get to go and tell people who never, ever, ever heard. You're looking into the eyes of somebody that God has created. They're God's creature. They're not his child yet. And when you're talking to them, they have no idea what you're talking about. They've never heard Jesus' name before. But when they get saved, when God, when God 
gives them an understanding. They understand, oh, this is what you're talking about. Yes, that's what I want. When you do that, then you know, and it's not you. I've never saved anybody, but God's let me be a part of watching him save people all over the world. You want to hasten the day of the two? You really want to get out of here quick? Let's go tell everybody that we can tell. And it'll hasten the day. That's scripture, that's not me. I do like that scripture, though. <laughs> but he spoke about the things in this discourse, which he also spoke of Sermon on the Mount. And uh, when he's recording the events of the age to come. So the gospel of the kingdom that will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to the nation. And then the end will come. That's in Matthew 24 and verse 14. So, so if we go out and we'll tell people that don't know about Jesus, Jesus, some of those will become believers, some will reject. Some of them will not, they say, no, no, I'm not interested, but others will. And it is heartbreaking when you tell people, when you tell people, when you tell people, when you tell people, and they, they keep rejecting. They're not rejecting you. I've never been rejected. He's been rejected a lot. But the, so we don't have anything to fear. The Church of Jesus Christ is the heart of the people. The kingdom is life. It's worth noting that the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom is not preaching of a revolution. Yet when, when Pilate asked Jesus, are you really a king? Jesus said yes. He confirmed it. He's more though than merely a king. He's also the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way to God. He is the truth against all lies. He is the one who will destroy the father of all lies, the devil. He is the life. He's eternal life. And he does not merely propagate that theology or a philosophy. Instead, he preaches himself. Have you ever thought about that? I don't preach me. If I preach me, I have nothing to value to you for you whatsoever. I preach Jesus. Jesus himself preached what? The living word preached the written word. He's preaching himself. We're saying Jesus do when he comes back. The principle he's going to destroy the rule of creation at fall. Remember when he said in Genesis chapter 3 verse 17, cursed is the ground because of you. The ground has been cursed ever since and that will be removed. All curses will be removed in the new kingdom. But the creation is subject now to frustration because of the choices that humanity has made. But there's a day coming when the church will be a part of the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans 8 chapter 8 verse 20 to 22 talks about it'll be when Jesus comes back it'll be like when pains of childbirth you'll know it's about to happen don't know exactly when you know sometimes you know your, your wife goes in for to have a child and the doctor says well it won't be long now probably two or three hours and something happens and 14 hours later your wife <laughs> says if you ever touch me again I'll murder you <laughs> you know you got an idea of what's coming but you're not exactly sure turning point for history is past. Jesus Christ was that turning point and when he died the question is what more could be done? Nothing more could be done. Nothing else needs to be done. He's risen from the dead. He's the bulkhead, if you will, of victory. And with all victory comes to him from the point, from this point on, which is resurrection, after the death of burial resurrection, everything was going to be different. First, he will establish his kingdom in the hearts and minds of his people. He's already done that. And next, even according to Micah, chapter 4 and verse 3, he talks about people will not uh, learn of war, no more. there'll be no more war, no more, uh, nothing but peace on earth. The Antichrist, he will be a part of this. The Antichrist is, the, of course, anti means against, and he will be the one who claims to be God, and he will say, I'm the other Christ, I am the true Christ. He's a part of this. The Greek word means to be in place of. He puts his self in place of God. There are limitation kingdoms that we ought to watch out for. We need to, to realize anytime God's doing something, the devil's also trying to copy him, trying to mimic him, and to, to, to do it uh, for detriment. So in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 11, uh, when it's talking about the word of God will pay for their lives. If you fast forward to Revelation 17, 6, he talks about the one who will stand at the end will be saved. And by the way, Thessalonians makes it clear, if you are a true believer, you will persevere. Okay? If you're not a true believer, you will not persevere. 
because when, when trials and tribulations come, and you, this isn't the worker. And you just said, I'll just get rid of it. You know, James talked about they were with us, but they were not of us. When they weren't part of us. They looked like they were, they smelled like they were, you know, act like they were, but they were not with us, really. They're just on a journey with us. When a journey gets too hard, then they go home, so to speak. The truth is the kingdom of God is a kingdom of peace, and it will come only when Christ returns. This event will be preceded by God's worldwide catastrophic and apocalyptic judgments. If we read Revelation, and I know you all, I know all of you like Revelation. And, and I love Revelation. I really do. But i got to be honest with you. I don't want to live through it. I know what's coming. That's why I'm thankful. According to Thessalonians, it appears that the rapture will take place before the Lord comes back. Could be wrong. Been wrong before. I do, I do like what Debbie told her boss. Uh, he, was a, he thought you were going to stay here through the seven years of tribulation and then be raptured out. And Debbie said, well, Dr. Cohen, that's, that, that's good. You stay here behind because I'm leaving. <laughs> Jesus comes back. I'm going. You can, you can have this. But I need another secretary. You know. The point is this. God's judgment is worldwide. And there is worldwide judgment that's coming. Um, and God's going to squelch all the demonic powers of the world and establish his kingdom. And when he establishes his kingdom, king of it will be totally impossible for anything else to happen that is not his will. His will always happens. It always will be done. God even uses these things that we have to go through to, for his will. And the, the new kingdom, we talk about the old kingdom, the current kingdom, and the new kingdom. In the new kingdom, that day will be peace and joy. What does Paul say? That God himself can walk away all the tears from your eyes. Because you're going to be broken hearted. You didn't do more for him. I'm going to be on my face before God and say, God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. God, forgive me for not doing more for you. You give me all these opportunities. You know, if I could change anything in my life, one thing I think I would change is four years before I surrendered to God in the ministry, I knew God was calling me. Four years. And if I could do anything, I'd say, God, give me those four years back. I'll surrender. Or, that's something that bothers me. I could have served him four more years. And now I'm 69 on the verge of 70. That's it seems like it's a long time ago, but it would have, it would have been really great if the first time God said, hey, this is what I want from you. When his kingdom comes, all of, all, of, all of Christianity will go to be with him forever. Uh, let me give you this, and I'll, then I will, I'll let you go. One thing is certain. The church is not going to bring the kingdom. We are the kingdom, but we're not bringing it. Another thing is certain, God himself will bring the kingdom. So there's no need to speculate on it. No need to, to try to figure out when exactly, how close are we? I think we're close. But it could be a thousand more years. We don't know. By the way, I find it interesting that synagogues, Jewish synagogues, in some places in the world, they close them down. Why would they do that? Because you need to, to watch the, the news and see what's happening in Israel. I ain't talking about the war. There's another mass influx of Jews from around the world because they believe God's up to something. They're looking for Jesus' first coming. We know the next time he comes, it's his second coming. But there are about hordes and hordes of them coming back to Israel. Well, what does what does the Bible say about that? It says when that day of the Lord comes again, what's going to happen? He's going to draw all them back. God's not done with Israel. And that's why I say, if y'all want to mess with Israel, go ahead. Bad, bad choice, though. You know, because God's made a promise to them. Anyway, um, any questions? All right, next week we'll look at um, that will be done. And then, of course, how we want his will to be done, as it is in heaven, on earth that way. Um, as far as for praying tonight, if you want to, if you want to pray where you're at, you can. If you want to get along with your spouse or something and, and pray, you can. You can come pray at the altar. Uh, <coughs> I do want to have a time of prayer though, that we pray for God's kingdom, that it will come. It's here, 
and not the final kingdom. When this next kingdom comes, it's a kingdom that will stand forever and ever and ever. And that's the kingdom that he's telling us. Pray it is that, that the Father will send the kingdom. And that's what they should be on our shoulders. So let's pray for that. And you like to, you can you can pray together. I tell you what I'm gonna do in maybe next